I want to give you a very warm welcome to our service this evening. And uh, let me just, I'll not go through all the announcements of this morning, but just a few things I want to draw your attention to. So don't forget on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, we finish our series on the life of Gideon. And uh, also we announced this morning about, we're hoping on this Wednesday night and also next Wednesday night, God willing, uh, we're trying to organize a bit of a, a work party to uh, clean up just the outside of the church. And even you see how the uh, things are sort of overgrown a little bit in the side there. So just to even try and get some of that even tidied up as well. So on uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday night at seven o'clock, that is, and also next Wednesday at seven. So um, if you intend to go to that, please uh, let some of the office bearers know as well, just so we get a little bit of an indication in that. And also we hope to organize uh, something of an outreach on the, the 12th uh, as well. So if you're around on the 12th of July, if you're not aware on your holidays yet, or if, uh, you'd like to help, or if thinking of going to hand out some Discovery uh, magazines, these are these, they're great little evangelistic magazines uh, that have been greatly used by a number of ba- Baptist churches and uh, we hope to hand those out on the, the 12th day, just hopefully as the, the parades are passing by the church, or we might even go to different parts of the town as well uh, to do that. So if you'd like to help out with that, just uh, please see Alfie and give your, your name to him. So these are all the announcements, and just pray even about all those different things as well too. But we're going to begin tonight by singing. It's a hymn that's actually based on the very well-known hymn, My Hope Was Built in Nothing Less, but it's a, a hymn called Cornerstone. And that is in Christ alone. He is our cornerstone, the one in whom we build our life, the one whom our hope is even upon as well. And let's stand and sing this together, please.
consciousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Let's pray together. Let's come before the Lord in prayer and ask for his help and blessing upon our service tonight. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks for the confidence that we can have in Christ Jesus, the one who is our cornerstone, the one who we can build our very lives upon. Father, we come tonight not just to pray for ourselves, but to pray even for all the churches, Lord, even who meet tonight wherever the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, even for the churches, even in our uh, Baptist Missions Church family. Those even who we can give thanks for even the baptisms that took place even a number of weeks ago in Bell Turbot. We pray, Lord, even that these young believers will grow in their faith. We pray for Joel and for others even as they disciple them. We pray also for the baptismal service even that has taken place today, even in the Moors Church in France. We do want to thank you, Lord, that souls are continually being added to the kingdom. And we pray, Lord, that you to help us even as we seek to reach people even in our area here. Father, give us this burden for the lost. We pray, Lord, for the outreach even that we seek to do here, whether that outreach is online or in person as well. Father, we do pray that you'll give us guidance and wisdom even as we do look even for new opportunities to, to reach out, as we plan even for the summer outreaches as well to, Lord, just help us even with arrangements that need to be made for that. Father, help each one of us even just to, to live for you as we ought, to walk worthy even of our calling, to remember even the great responsibility that we have, even to be lights in this dark world, to reflect even of your light to that world. Help us, Lord, as we seek to do that. And Father, even as we meet around your word, even as we praise you together, Lord, as we sing these hymns, Father, we do pray for others who may be watching this online. We pray that these messages will be a, a source of encouragement, even a help to them. And Father, may it be a help to us even as we gather here tonight. So, Lord, be glorified through all that takes place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before we read God's word together, we're going to sing another chorus together. This is great as the Lord and most worthy of praise. We'll just stay seated as we sing these next uh, two hymns. So great as the Lord and most worthy of praise. And then we'll read God's word just after that.
Perhaps turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. And we're continuing on with our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And tonight we're going to just look at a, just an, another small section of this uh, sermon. And it's verses 17 to 20. Uh, we were looking last week at what it means to be disciples. What it means to be, live in this world as a, as a follower of Christ. To be even salt and light. But tonight we're looking at something as a, a, as what many say is, is actually a, a critical passage to understand the whole Sermon on the Mount. So uh, as we go through some of these, we'll, we'll look at some smaller sections. Other times we might look at a larger uh, passage together. But uh, this passage helps us even in our understanding of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. So it is a fairly critical one. So Hebrews chapter 7, sorry, sorry not Hebrews chapter 7, Matthew chapter 5, what am I on about? Verse 17. What can I say? It's been a long day. It's a warm day. Right, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And we know that God will... Bless his word, even as we read and study it together. Before we turn to this passage again, um, we're going to sing another hymn. Now, we'd, we'd sung this some time ago. I think we actually, last time we used it was during our lockdown services. So I hope you're watching that lockdown service when this was used. Uh, but we're going to stay seated as we, we sing this. This is a, a beautiful hymn uh, called Grace. And it's one actually that's very special significance to Emma and myself. We actually, it was sung at our wedding, actually, this hymn. So I'm relying on you to sing it well now, okay, once you get to know it. So if you don't know it, uh, even have a listen as we sing it, and then you can get to know it as we go along. But beautiful words of this hymn, Grace. And I'll just uh, sing it just now, please. Just stay seated as we sing it. Oh. 
Before we turn to God's word, let's pray once more. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, that we can testify of your saving grace, that we've experienced your goodness in our lives. Father, even as we've been reflecting on this this hymn, not only the grace which saves us, but also the grace which keeps us each day, but also the grace that will bring us even to your heavenly home, Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, even for this grace in which we stand, this grace even in which we can approach you. We want to give you thanks, Lord, even that we have in your word this wonderful Sermon on the Mount, preserved in Scripture for us, for how, Lord, it even teaches us about what it means to be a disciple, for how it shows us even how we can enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so, Father, just... Teach us even through tonight through it once more. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, please turn in your Bibles once more to Matthew chapter 5. You know, when Jesus began his ministry, he was one who divided opinion. While some came forward and believed and followed him, there was others who viewed him with curiosity. There was the crowds who came along, maybe just curious to hear what Jesus had to say or, or maybe to see what other miracle he would perform. Others were outraged at his ministry and his preaching, even with these, with these bold statements he made. Jesus calling the people to repent for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Yet for the religious leaders, often they were confused and concerned even by this. They viewed Jesus as some kind of revolutionary figure. They thought he was trying to start some kind of of revolution because some of the things which he did were against even their tradition. When they heard him preach about the kingdom of heaven, they were concerned. Was Jesus trying to to somehow reinterpret the, the law of Moses? Or was he even trying to do away with it? And so Jesus takes his disciples aside here and as he's been teaching them about the kingdom of heaven, He wants to explain to them what it means to be a follower of Christ. He's shown about the the character uh, of those who are disciples. He's shown also the blessings they receive. But he's also taught about the distinctiveness of believers, this salt and light, which we spoke about last week. But here in this passage, 
Many, as I say, view this as something of a foundation for the whole sermon. Because he's going to teach about the foundation of the, the inner qualities and the foundation necessary to function as salt and light. And that foundation is even the word of God. And the first thing Jesus does is to correct actually their, their misunderstanding regarding him, him and the, the scriptures. So that's what we're looking at tonight. Firstly, Jesus and the scriptures, verses 17 to 18. Jesus says to his disciples, don't think that I've come to abolish the, the law or the prophets. Some of the religious leaders were, were thinking this. Before we go any further, let's, let's define actually what Jesus meant when he was talking about the law and the prophets. The law here in verse 17, that little word the law is used a number of times in the New Testament. And sometimes it's, it's used to speak about generally about the commands of God. Other times it's, it's focusing even on the whole of the, the Old Testament. Here the law is uh, talking about the first five books of Moses. That's the context here in verse 17. What the Jews referred to as the, the Torah. Uh, the, the prophets then, what was this referring to? Now when we hear that, we think of the major and the minor prophets in the Old Testament. But when the, the Jew used this expression, the law and the prophets, they were basically talking about the, the whole of the Old Testament and that it was like a shorthand way of speaking of the, the whole of the scriptures. We remember even how Jesus in the road to Emmaus even referred to the law and the, the prophets. He was talking about the, the whole of the Old Testament scriptures. Basically, their Bible that they had at the time. So Jesus was saying, I haven't come to abolish or to do away with the Old Testament. But then what did Jesus come to do? Verse 17. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill. How did Jesus fulfill the Old Testament? He fulfilled the law and uh, the, 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 the prophets by fulfilling even the Old Testament uh, Prophecies. This word fulfill, you see, can use, be used in a couple of different ways. The word fulfill, if you were to look it up in your dictionary, you'd see it can mean to achieve or realize something. But it can also refer to carrying out a promised duty or role. You can fulfill your, your promise to someone. Uh, there's a sense in which Jesus fulfilled the law required. That's one sense you can take it. Jesus fulfilled the law. In his baptism, remember, Matthew said he fulfills. He came in order that he might fulfill all righteousness by completing what God requires of him. He was the one who, the only one who lived that perfect life and was without sin. But that's not the only sense in which Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. You see, he realized the prophecies and promises of the Old Testament. This is actually something, if you remember, that's been a concern of Matthew. Remember we said in Matthew's gospel to look out for that little word, fulfill. Because this, Matthew often says this, was, this happened in order to fulfill what was spoken of. It's something that Matthew constantly draws our attention to. This is because he has a, a Jewish audience in mind as he writes this. So they would be familiar with these Old Testament scriptures that Matthew was alluding to. And up to now, Matthew's used that phrase a number of times. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, at Jesus' birth, Matthew says how that Jesus' virgin birth fulfilled what was spoken in Isaiah the prophet. Also then, in, in Matthew 2, verse 6, Matthew says even where Jesus was born fulfilled the prophecy of Micah. Micah 5, 2. He would be born in Bethlehem. Then that is baptism. John the Baptist fulfilled the prophecy even uh, by preparing the way for Jesus. That too, Matthew says, was, spoke, was done to even fulfill what was spoken of before in the prophets. Here's this fulfillment. And these are just a few examples. Matthew goes on to give you many, many others of how Jesus fulfilled these things. He's, he's drawing our attention to it. He's, he's showing us how Jesus is the promised one, the promised king who would come. But there's another sense in which Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. He fulfilled the law in that he also brought all that the Old Testament spoke of and promised to completion. So he not only fulfilled the prophecies and promises of the Old Testament, but he also completed 
even what the Old Testament spoke of. In the Old Testament, you read of the, this image of sacrifice used often. We have the sacrificial system, the, the ceremonial law even that was given. And when you read in Leviticus and other places of the books of the, the law, these seem quite gruesome at times, don't you, when you read of this, the blood being shed. Yet these sacrifices were necessary in order to atone for sin. But yet those sacrifices actually were pointing the way. We're pointing the way to Jesus' greater sacrifice. In Hebrews 10, we read that those sacrifices were but a shadow of the good things to come. They were but a shadow, those Old Testament sacrifices. But Jesus was the realization of those things, the good things to come. In Matthew 10, we read, those sacrifices, talking about the Old Testament sacrifices, needed to be repeated and offered every year because he says the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sins. But these sacrifices are no longer necessary because Christ's once for all sacrifice could atone for sin. That does not need to be repeated. He gave and offered up his life. He was the the ultimate sacrifice. Christ fulfilled. He completed that sacrificial system. That's why we don't have things like this today. Because Jesus fulfilled that. He completed it. Also, think of other things, how other types even are which are completed even in the Old Testament. There's the images of the, the there's the prophets, there's the, the priests and the, the kings as well. Think of how Moses was promised that a greater prophet would come, one from among his own people. And yet Jesus was that greater one, that word made flesh, the one who spoke the very words of God. Even the priesthood spoke and pointed to Christ. Again in Hebrews you see those those links taking place. That's why I slipped and said Hebrews at the start of the message tonight because there's many links we see there in Hebrews between the Old Testament and, and the New Testament. It builds those bridges for us. Jesus, the, you see the priest would be the, the mediator. He would be the mediator between the people and, and God. And Jesus was the great high priest. He was the ultimate mediator, the great intercessor. When he not only offered a sacrifice, he was the sacrifice. Then what about the image of the, the kings? The kings. The kings were seen as the servant of God, God's representative. But think of how even that points to Jesus as well. David was promised there would be one, David, even greater than you, one from your line, who will reign forever. How that will be fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And as Jesus fulfilled these Old Testament prophecies, as he completed even of what the Old Testament even pointed towards, it says even on the road to Emmaus, and what a Bible study that must have been, to have Jesus the master teacher open up the scriptures and explain from the Old Testament how they pointed to him. See, the prophets even foretold of a, of a new covenant. They had the old covenant system. And yet, in uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, we read of this new covenant would come where even the law would be written in people's hearts, where even they would be given the heart of stone would be replaced with a heart of flesh, and able to obey even the commands of God. This came about through the new covenant which Jesus brought about through his blood. So he fulfilled the, the Old Testament prophecies. He fulfilled the law in a sense. He kept the law. But he fulfilled in that he completed these things. Yet while there were certain Old Testament laws that were, that were set aside in the New Testament, such as the sacrificial system and the, the dietary laws and so on as well, and also likewise the priest too, we no longer need to, to go to a priest today because Jesus is our great high priest. We come to him. We come to God for forgiveness and find it in Christ. But there's certain other things Jesus said about the Old Testament law that, that remain. Jesus didn't come to abolish everything completely in the Old Testament. Those commands against idolatry, murder, adultery and stealing. Jesus didn't do away with these. No, no. Jesus affirmed them also 
whenever he was asked to even summarize the commandments, what was the greatest commandments? Remember, we talked about that this morning. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. To also love your neighbor as yourself. Now, and these even summarize the, the whole of those commandments. This is why Jesus says to them here, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, verse 18, unless, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until, until all is accomplished. This is what he was saying. I didn't come to, to do away with all these things. Jesus came to complete these things. If you're reading from the King James Version, it talks about a jot or a, or a tittle. The Old Testament, of course, was, was written, you see, in, in Hebrew. And the smallest of these letters was the, uh, the Ode, or, or in Greek this was represented by the smallest letter, the Iota, as mentioned here. And this dot spoken of here, many think that's talking about, if, if you've ever seen Hebrew written, it's very strange writing to, to us today, but even a little dot can actually make a difference as to how those words are interpreted. So Jesus is saying, the point is, from the smallest letter in Hebrew to, the, to even the smallest stroke of the pen, none of these will pass from the law till it is accomplished. See, the Old Testament points to the Messiah. Jesus wasn't saying, don't bother with it or, or don't worry about that now. No, we still need to pay attention to the Old Testament well. It still points to Christ. Jesus was saying, verse 18, these Old Testament scriptures remain true until... Uh, two things will happen. Either this heaven and earth passes away or until everything is accomplished. Do you know the Bible speaks of a day, doesn't it, when this world will be judged, when people will be called to give an account at the judgment seat of Christ. There will be a day then when there will be a new heavens and a new earth. That's not just spoken of in the New Testament, not just in Revelation. No, it's also spoken of in the Psalms. Psalm 102, verses 25 and 26. Of old, it says, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away. The heavens and the earth will one day be destroyed, but God and his word will remain until that day. And his word will remain until all has been accomplished. There's still more to follow, isn't there? Why, we've seen many things fulfilled even in Christ. There's still more to come. There's still more to come. You know, so Jesus is affirming the authority of the Scriptures. He's saying you still need to, to pay attention to these, the Old Testament. That doesn't mean you can just disregard them. No, no, you can learn even from these, as you look at the sacrifices, you can see how these point to me. As you consider the high priest, you, you consider how that even speaks of me. As you look at even how Psalms and, and even Proverbs as well, how they even point to Christ as well. How they show us in Proverbs even how we ought to live. You don't, you're not doing away with that. No, no, you need to still pay attention to this. But Jesus spoke about his relationship to the Scriptures and he corrected that misunderstanding that some had. He didn't, wasn't coming to try and abolish them, but actually he spoke about something else. See, there were many who, who thought, and as Jesus spoke, as they heard him even talk about, you know, even forgiving sin, there were some of the religious teachers who were outraged. How dare Jesus speak in this way? They thought, how dare Jesus talk in this way? How can he forgive sin? Sure, God can only forgive sin. They didn't yet truly believe who he was. They thought, how can Jesus declare something, declare someone as righteous? But you see, Jesus not only wants to correct their thinking regarding the scriptures, but look at verses 19 to 20, because Jesus is about to teach them about Jesus and true righteousness, what it means to have true righteousness. Jesus gives this sober warning in verse 19. He says, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now the Jewish rabbis, you see, in Jesus' day, they'd taken the Old Testament laws and they tried to divide them up. They had worked out there were 613 of these laws. 
And they had divided them up into some negative commands. In other words, some things you, you don't do. And the positive commands, some things you should do. They'd also tried to categorize them as in these things are the lighter commands or these things are maybe weightier commands. That's how they, they devised all these as well. They tried sort of saying, well, that's how they should be treated. That's how they should be interpre- interpreting. But here in verse 19, Jesus is de- demanding his followers follow both the least of the commands and the greatest. You follow the, the scriptures, follow them. He commands them to not only do his word, but teach it. But look at the righteousness that Jesus talks about in verse 20, needed in the kingdom of heaven. And what a standard this is. The fact that Jesus is going to demand a righteousness that is even greater than the scribes and Pharisees. Now, if you were a follower of Jesus in that day, you knew the scribes and Pharisees well. You'd be well used to hearing of these figures. The scribes, you see, they were, they were the experts in the law of God. They were the people who not only taught the law, but if you wanted to know how does the law of God you know, how does this apply in this given circumstance in my life? You would go to a scribe, you would ask them, and they would, they would teach you, they would advise you. So they were considered to be the experts in the law. Who were the Pharisees? They were the renowned, this, this strict religious sect, for their, their strict observance of the law. That's what they were famous for. They tithed money, they were, they were careful about the, the company they kept, and even the food they ate. And what they did was they took the, the commands of God, the, the, the commandments, the law that God given, and they thought to themselves, lest we break those commands, we better safeguard them. So what they did was they created other traditions of their own. These were known as the traditions of the elders. So maybe one rabbi would come along and he would say, well, if we want to preserve the Sabbath day, here's what we should do. We should not do this or, or not do that. And as time went on, as different rabbis came and went, they added on more tra- uh, traditions of their own. So what they seen that this is doing was almost like building a fence around the law of God. They did that well-intentioned. They were trying to protect the law of God. They thought that, that people would obey it. But what they had done, they'd made the law of God into a burden. Because they were actually elevating their commands as the same level as the law of God, which it was not. These were traditions of men they passed down. These were legalistic, often, people. And the thing was, is if you'd asked anyone in that day who was the religious people of the day, they would have pointed at the scribes, the, the ones who taught the law. They would have pointed at the Pharisees, people who were known for being righteous. And yet Jesus says you've got to be even more righteous, or sorry, even more uh, you know, righteous than they are. You've got to be even more righteous than they are. You can almost imagine people breaking out into a cold sweat when they heard this. But what did Jesus have to say about these scribes and Pharisees? These people who were concerned about being outwardly righteous. Jesus, of course, had some harsh things to say about them. That's why I say when we talk about Jesus being gentle and lowly, he wasn't afraid to, to confront even those who were sinning. Matthew 23, verse 25, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And look, listen to what he calls them, hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. He was speaking of these Pharisees themselves. They were concerned with all these purity rituals. They had ritual washing and cleansing. But yet Jesus was saying, you're doing all these things. You're fixing up the outside. But but what about your heart? How is it before God? At one point in that same passage in Matthew 23, Jesus confronts them once more. And he even likens them to whitewashed tombs. He says, you're like whitewashed tombs because outwardly you appear beautiful, but within you're full of dead people's bones and uncleanness. You outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. In other words, Jesus was saying, it's no good being righteous on the outside if you're not righteous on the inside. 
See, what was happening is these people were, were, were trying to keep this big list of things. And they'd taken the law, which was meant for good. It was meant to show the very character of God. The law was meant to drive people to their need of God. And they'd taken something that was good and made it a burden. They'd made it a heavy burden that weighed upon the people. With all these lists and regulations, which were, were not according to the word of God. But there were traditions of men. And these people in observing these, they'd become proud. These people would stand on street corners and pray. They didn't do that because they were sincerely trying to seek God, but they did it to be seen. They became filled with pride. See, outwardly they appeared religious, but inwardly their heart was not right with God. But yet as people heard this, And as Jesus said in verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, people heard those words and and they would have elevated the scribes and Pharisees up there. They would have said, oh, those are the people to look up to. That's how they would have viewed them. But yet Jesus saw to the heart, didn't he? He saw how they truly are. But Jesus was really saying, if you want to enter into this kingdom, you need a, a perfect righteousness. But how can you have perfect righteousness? Do you know, this was something that Martin Luther struggled with. Martin Luther was a a priest who lectured in theology in the University of Wittenberg. But although he studied theology, he had went to, through the Catholic Church, went to confession. He performed all the penance that the priest told him. But he wrestled with this issue of righteousness. How could I be truly righteous? That's what he struggled with. Here was a man who knew God's word, who had a sincere heart for the word of God, but he couldn't find assurance. How do I know he, I'm truly saved? Luther, we see, was trying, was relying on, on works. Initially, he was relying on those works in his life. He was thinking, if only I do this, if only I live better, if only try and live a, a good life. But yet, he couldn't find that assurance. What made the difference in Luther's life? As he was teaching to others, he was studying the book of Romans. And the book of Romans had a profound effect in Luther's life. He came across a phrase that that really captured him and he couldn't get away from it. In Romans chapter 1 verses 6 to 17, it says there, The righteousness of God has revealed in the gospel. This phrase, the righteousness of God. Luther thought, what does that mean, the the righteousness of God? See, he'd sought to to live his life as best he could, but yet Luther was all too aware of his sin in his own heart. He was all too aware of his shortcomings. He wondered how ever could he be declared righteous with God. So Luther, in his studies, came to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, where righteousness is talked about once again. Romans 3 verses 21 to 25. The righteousness of God has been, re- has been manifested apart from the law. Luther must have went, hold on a minute, manifested. The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although it says the law and the prophets bear witness to it. See, Luther had been living his life trying to, to do his best. Maybe like these Pharisees. He'd been trying to to live to keep all the best of the regulations he could. To live how he thought God wanted him to be. Yet he still struggled with his own sinfulness. But he would go on in Romans 3 to read these words. How Paul spoke of the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. The righteousness of God. How do we get that? Through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. See, he began to see that the issue was he needed a righteousness outside of himself. See, no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't be righteous. No matter if he got up that day and tried to keep all of God's commands and tried to be perfect and not not sin in word, thought, or deed, and yet he would find that often he fell short. He couldn't be righteous. He needed a righteousness outside of himself, one that was given by God. And Paul, Paul explained that in many ways to him. Martin, it comes from 
not from works. It comes by faith. It comes by God's grace. It comes by recognizing our sin, our inability to save ourselves. It comes because Christ became that offering for sins. The perfect one had our sins laid upon him. He was punished for for your sins and mine. But through faith in his saving sacrifice, here's the thing, we can receive his perfect righteousness. The term the Bible uses, of course, is justified. Justified. It's a legal term. It's It's a declaration. If someone is justified, they are declared righteous. The one who trusts in Christ alone, through faith alone, God looks upon us. And he looks upon us when we trust in Christ and turn from our sin and turn to God and believe in him. He no longer looks upon us as a sinner. He looks upon us as clothed in Christ's righteousness. That's what God sees. That's why he declares us as righteous. Martin Luther began to see that no amount of striving in his life could ever make him righteous. No amount of good deeds could ever earn the salvation of God. It needs to come by grace. It comes about only through faith in Christ. This Luther realized was the only way he could stand before the holy God. He began to realize we are justified by his grace as a gift, Paul would write, through the redemption that is in Christ. Do you know in Zechariah 3 we read of that lovely picture. In Zechariah 3, and we'll be turned it even when you get home tonight, Because we see the prophet given a vision of Joshua. Joshua, the high priest, standing before the Lord, covered in filthy garments. And Satan stands before him, trying to accuse Joshua. And yet, what does God do? He says, I've taken your iniquity away from you. I've clothed you in in clean garments. What a fitting description, and what a fitting vision that is of our state before God. If we've trusted in Christ, if we've turned to him, turned from our sin, turned to God and trusted that that Jesus paid our debt. If we've trusted in that, if we believed in that with all our heart, then we are clothed in his righteousness. When Satan tries to accuse, when Satan maybe casts to our mind those sins of the past, when maybe those times when you, you fail and seek God's forgiveness and, and maybe sometimes you say to yourself, how, how can God ever love me? You know, we know we're not perfect here in this life. We are to, to seek to live for God now. But we still struggle even with indwelling sin, don't we? Satan tries to tempt us. Yet we can turn to Satan and say, Satan, we are clothed in Christ's righteousness now clothed in Christ's righteousness, forgiven, cleansed. What a wonder that is. Martin Luther, you see, was going through life wondering, how can I, he didn't have no assurance, how can I be declared righteous? Paul gave him the answer in Romans 3. Jesus is saying here to his disciples, you're going to need a perfect righteousness. He's going to go on to show them how they can have that righteousness. It's not going to come about through following the, these regulations of the Pharisees, their traditions. You need the righteousness that only God can give. See, the Pharisees had tried, hadn't they? They tried to, to earn their way in keeping all these regulations, yet they'd become filled with pride. They'd focused on the outward and not focused on the heart. We're going to see God willing next week when Jesus turns the attention upon the heart. Correcting even their understanding about what sin is. See, as Jesus said these words to the hearers, you can almost imagine how those words had an impact on those hearers for the first time in verse 20. They looked upon the scribes and the Pharisees as those religious leaders. And yet when Jesus says, you need a greater righteousness, they must have thought, what hope is there? See, Jesus was driving them to God. He wasn't driving them to the regulations and the legalism that the the Pharisees lived their life by. He was going to point out the grace and the righteousness that comes from God. It's found 
True righteousness is found in recognizing that we are sinners before God and realizing that we can't be righteous in and of ourselves. We can't earn our way to heaven. We need the righteousness that he supplies through faith in Christ. Think how Paul, whenever he wrote those words, even in Romans, how he knew well and understood even the life of a Pharisee. Paul had been there, hadn't he? Paul had lived that life. He tried to live as he ought to. He began to realize that all his achievements, that as he thought, all his law keeping wouldn't save him. He began to realize that. He began to realize even his spiritual heritage didn't account for anything before God because it was a matter of was his heart right before God. He needed to know Christ as Lord. He needed to seek his righteousness. And that's what Jesus is doing here in verse 20. He's driving them to their true need of righteousness, to the one who can give righteousness. But Paul's days of striving cease because he found the rest in Christ alone. What amazing grace that God can take the sinner, that God can take the broken, and even the rebel can find a home with Christ. That life once broken by sin can be made new in Christ Jesus. What is your confidence in life and death tonight? We've sung about it at our very beginning. Your hope is built, is it built on Christ? Is he the cornerstone of your life? Do you know if you're building your life in anything else, it's going to fail. It's going to crumble. But if you build your life in Christ, he is one who will never fail. He was one who will never disappoint And so I invite you, if you don't know the Lord as you watch even this tonight, come experience God's amazing grace and forgiveness that is found in Christ alone. Let us sing about that even as we close tonight. This is amazing grace. My my chains are gone. Can we stand to sing this please? And then I'll close in prayer.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, for your great love and your amazing grace. Father, we give you thanks, Lord, even that you supply the righteousness that we need, that it comes about through faith in Christ, that when we put our faith in him, when we believe that he was the one who died for our sins and rose again, Father, his perfect righteousness is credited to our account, and so we give you thanks for that. Father, for those of us who are in Christ, may that even encourage us to know that when the enemy tries to discourage us, to remember, Lord, that the price for sin has been paid. Jesus paid it all, and it's all to him that we owe. Father, we want to give you thanks that you supply what we need, Lord, in Christ Jesus. And so, Father, may you use this word tonight, Lord, even to speak maybe to someone who doesn't know you. Use it for your glory. And Lord, help us even as we leave here tonight. Lord, take us to your homes in safety. In Jesus' name, amen.